I invite you to turn with me to the sixth psalm. The sixth psalm. And I invite you to turn in the bulletin to the back page, and you could follow along at least with the outline, and it's a good place to take notes. Herm, it's a little, I'm getting a little ring if you want to take it down just a hair. Thank you. Psalm 6 is our text, and I want to to ask you this, if you find yourself in a place where you could say that the temptation has claimed the battle, it seems like the night has won, that your hopes are sinking, that the winds of doubt have blown through you, and your sails have been all but torn. These are words that we're going to sing in just a few minutes. Psalm 6 is for such a sufferer. Psalm 6 is a song. It might sound strange if I gave this song to Pastor Jay to sing. I mean, we would sing these kinds of words on a Sunday morning. Rebuke me not, O God, in your anger. Heal my bones. For I am languishing. My soul also is greatly troubled. It's terrified. Every night I flood my bed with tears. And bring the chorus in. I flood my bed with tears. I mean that would sound strange wouldn't it? All my enemies shall be ashamed and greatly troubled. I mean that doesn't sound like a worship song. It sounds more maybe like blues. Or a country song. You know maybe it's. The country of Judea song, but not worship music. But the psalm, the psalmist teaches us how to, that we are to sing this song. We are to know this song. This, you see, the psalms teach us how to give our emotions, our desperations, our pains to God. The psalms teach us God's ways with man and man's pain on earth. And they often put words to what we often feel. And so it is true with Psalm 6. The Psalms remind us that we as believers are afflicted in many ways. Jesus Christ could have prayed this psalm in the Garden of Gethsemane. David prayed this psalm and put it to use for the worship. You broken this morning? Unmended? Maybe you've been broken and you've been mended and you've seen God at work. Well, that's the true in the life of David. Psalm 6 begins with a desperate cry of David pleading for mercy and grace in the midst of near death illness, emotional agony caused by unnamed enemies, all because of the discipline of God on his life. And it ends with him defiantly rebuking his enemies with a total faith and assurance that God has heard his cry and will grant him mercy. So let's read Psalm 6. I'm going to read it if you follow along. Psalm 6, 10 verses. If I were to read it appropriately, in one sense, we could cry as I read it because there's just this, this lament, this anger, this sadness. Oh, Lord. Rebuke me not in my, your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled. My soul is greatly troubled. But you, O Lord, how long? Turn, O Lord. Deliver my life. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. For in death... There's no remembrance of you. In Sheol, who will give you praise? I am weary with moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with weeping. My eye wastes away because of grief. It grows weak because of all my foes. Depart from me, all workers of evil. 
For the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies shall be ashamed and greatly troubled. They shall be turned back and be put to shame in a moment. Praise the Lord. There are many ways in which you could divide this text. You could divide it in one way. You could say in Psalm 6, you have the believer broken and then mended. And that's verses 1 through 7, he's broken. And verses 8 through 10, he's being and is mended. The way I want to point it to you is I see four stanzas here. Verses 1 through 3, 4 through 5, 6 and 7, and then 8 through 10. You have an introductory plea. It's in the back of your bulletin. There's a plea to God. And then there's requests to God. And then there's a lament to God. And then there's defiant assurance and confidence in God. Let's look at these. And let's learn from about David. Let me say this again. Let's learn about prayer from David. Let's learn and let's listen to what the Spirit is saying to our hearts this morning. Psalm 6, verses 1 through 3, is our, he begins with his plea to God. Oh, Lord, I mean, rebuke me in your anger, not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. Be gracious to me, O oh Lord, for I am languishing. Heal me, O oh Lord, for my bones are troubled. My soul is greatly troubled, but you, O oh Lord, how long? Do you, do you hear the cry, the plea? Oh, Lord, rebuke me, not in discipline, but and rebuke me in discipline, but not in your anger or wrath. There, there's a lot of things that are going on in these first three verses. David is in the pits. David is in discouragement and affliction. And I could just, I want to list to you, list to you some of the things that David says he's going through, and maybe you can relate to them. First of all, David is physically ill. To the point where he thinks he might die. He says here, heal me, O God, for my bones are troubled. This is a description of he's saying, heal me, my bones, which to the Hebrew was representative of their whole body, their, how they're doing, the, the very fiber of their body. And he's saying, heal me because I am really sick. It's it's hard to be really sick. Some of you have been really sick, maybe are really sick and watching online, or we'll watch this later. And you feel that physically. And for David, I think David felt the fear of dying. He was fearful that he would die. Now, that, that is really hard. But you add to that, and, and I already started to say this with the fear part, it's not that he's just physically sick, dying, but his soul as well. And he's so encouraged that he could go to heaven and God is taking care of him. And the words and the promises of God are just flowing through your heart. That's not how it is with David. Because you see, not only is his body broken and he feels like he's dying physically, but he is just aching like crazy inside. It says here, O oh Lord... My bones are in trouble, are troubled. My soul is greatly troubled. My soul is greatly troubled. It means it is terrified. It is full of doubts. It is full of pain. It is depressed. It is discouraged. It is despondent. Whatever word you want to put, my soul is a mess. I am discouraged. I am sad. I am hurting. I cannot see anything good right now. Have you ever been there? And... Maybe you've been there and you've faced both. You've, and maybe they've, they've factored in on it. You're sick and, and hurting and it's affected your mood. Or in the other way, your mood and your soul and you're depressed and discouraged and you're sick emotionally and ang anxious. And that's affected your body. And so both of them are wrecked. So is, is with David. But that's not all. David has people stabbing him in the back. David has enemies. Do you have enemies? Maybe you haven't called them enemies, but if they're not enemies, what are they? They, they want to hurt you. They, they want to frustrate you. You do have the enemy, Satan, who wants to tempt you and who wants to discourage you and to accuse you and make you trust, distrust God. But maybe you have human enemies. David did, and he says in verse 7, My eye is 
it is wasting away because of my foes, my enemies. David is hounded by enemies, and this doesn't stop. David says, how long, O God? When are you going to get rid of this? When are you going to take this away from me? But add all of these things up, and none of those compare, but they all contribute to something that's even worse for David. David is physically in pain. He's emotionally in pain. He is relationally in pain because of affliction. We don't know if it was his son, Absalom, later on in his life, or someone else that were attacking him. He doesn't, we don't, it doesn't say but David is afflicted because he knows he has displeased the God, displeased God at some point. And David is feeling guilty for his own sin. Have you ever suffered all these afflictions? You feel like you're being disciplined by God and you sit there and you don't feel any comfort because you're like, I deserve this. I'm here and I get I deserve every pain of suffering that I'm experiencing every drop of suffering that I have. It, I deserve it because I know what I did. And that's what David's probably going through. He's laying on his bed and he's thinking about, it's allowing his mind to think about his past sin. And I find that in verse 1 because he says, Oh Lord, rebuke me, but don't do it in your anger. Oh God, if you're going to discipline me, you could discipline me, but don't do it with your wrath. David, we don't know what the situation, it could be David early on in his, his kingship with Bathsheba and his adultery, could be later on with his numbering the people, we don't know what it is, but David, like you and I, when we experience troubles, we rarely can go, boy, I'm just so righteous, I can't imagine how he would deserve to ever be disciplined by God. I mean, if we're honest, we can look back and, all, and you could call it Satan tempting us to doubt God's forgiveness. We could call it whatever it is, but we could say, I'm struggling with, I know I've done this in the past and I know I deserve this. And maybe is that what's happening? It's coming upon me. David is feeling this guilt and this pain. And we can learn from these first three verses through what David does. David just says, God, if you're going to discipline me, and I invite the discipline. But treat me like a son and not an enemy. Oh God, I have enemies. And the way we de deal with enemies is we humiliate our enemies. But I have a son and I discipline my son. And I treat my son with discipline, but I love my son. Treat me like a son and not an enemy. Oh God, have mercy on me. And in verse 2, he says, be gracious to me. He says, please give me what I don't deserve. I deserve your wrath. I deserve your justice against me. I have not been upright in all these ways. But God, have mercy on me. Maybe you're here and you're feeling the weight of things and you feel afflicted. But you know you're not perfect so you can't go, God, I've been perfect. And like David, you can cry out, have mercy on me. Rebuke me not in my anger. You see, that's what David does. He says, oh God, heal me. Have mercy on me. How long, oh Lord? You see, the experience of David is not unlike the experience of we see godly people throughout history and in the Bible. The Apostle Paul will pen a letter to the Corinthians and say that we, he's talking about he and the other leaders, missionaries. He says, we were at a place where God afflicted us so much so that we thought we were going to die. In fact, we despaired of life itself. He says in 2 Corinthians 1.8, but this happened from God in order that we would learn not to rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. I just wonder where you are this morning or where you have been or if you know somebody that is in a place where they are feeling overwhelmed physically, emotionally, spiritually. This psalm is for you. This psalm is for every human being because they will, if they're honest, find themselves in these kinds of plights and difficulties. But let's move to verses 4 and 5. We see the psalmist starts and makes his formal request to God now. He's already said, God, be merciful to me. Be gracious to me. He now, in verses 4 through 5, says, Turn, O God, 
deliver my life. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. He makes an appeal. God, please save me. God, please deliver me. There, there could have come a time or it may have come a time in your life there has been a few times in my life, either with sickness or trials or things that I was in doubt where I'd say, oh, God, I need you to rescue me right now from this peril, this difficulty. Please help me. I'm in a mess. Have you been in there? Are you in that place right now? That's what David did. He cried out to God because David knew there was only one Savior. That Savior wasn't in his army. That Savior was not contained even in going to to the temple and getting the Ark of the Covenant and marching that into battle. That wasn't a savior. His one savior was in the Lord, his God, that he was praying to. He prayed this in Psalm 3, verse 8. Salvation belongs to their God. Your blessing be on your people. Or God, in Psalm 37, the salvation of the righteous is from Yahweh, the Lord. He is their stronghold in the time of trouble. The Lord helps those who, and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge. I am the Lord. There is no savior besides me, God tells Isaiah 43, in Isaiah 43, 11. And I want you to notice, and I just want to stop here and say, friends, if you are in trial today, it may be loneliness, it may be the suffering from your own sins, or it might be from what you feel is you have no idea why you are being afflicted the way you are being afflicted. It might be something that others think is small, but to you is a big deal. It might have to do with your school, it might have to do with finances, it might have to do with your family, and it's personal and it is a trial in your life. Call on the name of the Lord. There is one Savior, and that is Jesus. But I want you to see how David appeals. He uses arguments. He's like an attorney coming before a judge. And he makes arguments in his prayer. And to the believer, we take these psalms and we listen to them carefully. And we see, that's what David did. I'm going to do that. David prayed this way with these arguments. I'm going to pray. It might be that you have a child that you're just pleading with God that he would God would change her or him. That you're praying for a parent that needs salvation. It might be a neighbor. It might be a situation that is so difficult and trying to your life. And I want you to see what David did. He asked for salvation and then he made arguments. He made an appeal. He didn't say, Dave, God, I've been good all my life. So deliver, God. I deserve it. I've been a man after your own heart for all this time, and I've done all these hard things. Now do it. You owe me one now, God. No, that's not what David does. Is, do you see what he does here? He says, deliver me, my life. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. David pleads the steadfast love of God. This word steadfast love is a beautiful word in Hebrew. It's called, it's the word hased, which means God's covenant love. It's used throughout the Old Testament. It is translated steadfast love in our Bibles. And it means covenant loyal love. I have this ring here. This ring represents that I am covenantly bound to my wife, Molly. Molly, is co Molly made oaths to be loyal in her love to me and I loyal in my love to her. Well, Yahweh or God made covenant love and loyalty to his people. And he said to David and to his people, I will be your God and I will show everlasting love and mercy and grace to you. And I will put my affection on you and I will never leave you or forsake you. And he does that for all who are in Christ Jesus. If you have bowed your knee to Jesus and repented of your sins and asked him to save you. He becomes your savior and he forgives you of his sins. And God in Christ Jesus puts a covenant, makes a covenant with you. Jesus being the one that makes sure that ha it never is broken. And he says, I will love you forever. And we are to be like David and we are to appeal in all our prayers and agony say, God, the situation that I'm guilty about, because of your steadfast love, forgive me and help me. God, my child is in trouble. 
for your said fast love because you love me and I'm appealing to you and therefore you said you loved me, please help this situation. God, for your steadfast love, bring me out of this anxiety, this fear, this depression. Oh God, for your, God loves to hear his love thrown back at him. He loves to hear his covenant promises brought back to him in his prayer and saying, in appealing to that, God is loyal in his love. He will never forsake us. And he wants us to appeal like this. But notice the second argument that David makes. It sounds strange at first. For in death, verse 5, in death there's no remembrance of you. What does that mean? To in Sheol who will give you praise. Now David is not saying when you die, we go into this either soul sleep or non-existence and we never see you again. He doesn't believe in the resurrection. That's not what David believed. We know that in Psalm 16, he believes in the resurrection. I think this is a poetical way of David saying, when I die, I can no longer praise you on this earth. And I want to praise you on this earth all of the time. David's heart had already grown to love God and to treasure him. And that is the mark of a true believer. If you are a believer, you do want to praise God. It may be small and God grows your want to praise him. But if you're truly a believer, he puts that heart in you to praise him and to love him because he and his salvation has captured your heart. And you'll do what you always do with something that has captured your heart. See, I want you to see this. This is awesome. He's awesome. He has saved my soul. He is my God. He has shown a covenant love to me. Did you see what he did for me today? Did you see what he said in this book? Did you see what he's done? And David says, makes an argument to God saying, if I die, I'll no longer have opportunity to praise you. And I want you to be praised here. And I want to be part of that praising you. That's, that's a prayer that God doesn't always answer. And he didn't give that answer to Mike Bellows. God chose to take Mike Bellows home. But he does want us to have the motive, the desire that would cause us to make these prayers and appeals to God. And Mike, I was thinking about this. This, I think the application, the principle of this kind of prayer would be, I have a neighbor. Oh, God, would you save my neighbor? I, oh, God, would you just come and work in Richie's heart in a mighty way? Oh, God, if, he die, if he's right now spiritually dead, he hasn't called upon you. He doesn't have spiritual life. He's living toward the world. He's not living in trust to you. But, God, if, if he's dead to you, he's not praising you. So, God, please praise him so he Please bring him to life, rescue him so he will praise you. You might pray that for your kids or for your spouse or for some family member. As we pray, God, I want you to be praised, so come and rescue and deliver and save and bring me out of the pit that I'm in right now. Would you use those? I, th there you go. David has given us at least two tools in our prayer tool chest. As we go to God and we cry out to God, pleading his steadfast love in Jesus and pleading God so that you'll get praised. God, I want to praise you more. But I want you to see the lament in verses six through seven. See the lament. This, this is quite strong. Here's David. I am weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. Imagine posting that on Facebook or on your social media as your own personal testimony. You get a lot of, hopefully you get a lot of comments saying, I'm praying for you. David saying, I am weary with moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with weeping. My eye wastes away because of grief. It grows weak because of my foes. I bet somebody's either watching online or here this morning, and though you wouldn't say it this way, you'd say, it's about like that, Pastor. I'm up all night in my mind and my heart. Maybe not literally. It doesn't go away. I am so discouraged. I am blah. It just, I just shut it out. I just try to medicate on other things, and I am so discouraged. David says, my moaning, I'm weary of moaning. It has gone on long and long and long. And every night 
I drench my couch with tears. My eye wastes away because of grief and because of my foes. There's a couple things that we can note here is that God's people feel pain and affliction. They do. Let's have categories for that. Someone comes to you and says, I am so discouraged. Don't look at them and say, you must be very ungodly then. Or don't think that. God's people feel the afflictions and can be down and low. And notice that David wrote this, sung this, prayed this, wrote it down and gave it to his choir director and said, this is my testimony. I want you to sing it before the God's people. He wasn't embarrassed. He shared his emotions. And there is something about us living in community as a spiritual family, as a church, that when we are struggling, it is not only not wrong, it is actually right for us to come to certain people in our lives in the church and say, will you pray for me? I am discouraged. I am anxious. I am overwhelmed. Things are bad right now. I can't sleep. It has been hard. Would you pray for me? That's not what David's doing here. He's already come out of this, but he's teaching us. He's teaching us, and he does this, and he laments. The idea of lament, it's a strange word. I I preached on it a year ago when we were in Habakkuk, but lamenting is to cry out to God with pleading, usually because you're in a really bad place, and you usually ask a lot of questions like, God, why are you doing this? Or God, how long will this last? Or God, where is this coming from? God, Please relieve me, but it is an expression of declaration of I depend on you and I need you to be my savior in the situation and I trust you. And David laments and and expresses his grief to God. And I think there's an argument here that he's making to God. And I think it's something that we can also add into our prayers as we pray to God. I think what David is doing is saying, God, I know you care about me. God, I know you love me because of your steadfast love. I am hurting really bad. Please relieve me. That's implied. God, you, are, you put compassion in the human heart. All compassion in this world actually comes from you. And if you have compassion, you can see that I don't stop crying. Please give me relief and show pity. Oh, I believe that God wants us to be people that cry out to God and we express our pains and our suffering to God and he cares for us. It reminds me of a story that Charles Spurgeon once wrote. Charles Spurgeon was a great preacher in England, if you haven't heard of him. Most, a lot of people have. He was a great celebrity preacher in some ways. So many people, people all over the world knew him, but they didn't know that he struggled with depression and physical suffering of all kinds. One of them was gout, and it was just, they didn't have the medicines to help him. And he would go through these periods that was just agonizing. And he writes of a story where he says, When I was racked some months ago in pain in an extreme degree so that I could no longer bear it without crying out. I mean, he was moaning and crying. I asked all my, my attendants, my family, my nurses that were with me to leave me alone. Go out. And then I had nothing I could say to God, but I said this, God, thou art my father, and I'm your child. And thou, as a father, art tender, full of mercy. I could not bear to see my child suffer as you make me suffer. And if I saw him tormented as I am now, I would do what I could to help him. And I would put my arms under him to sustain him. Will you Thou hide thy face from me, thy father. Wilt thou still lay on a heavy hand and not give me a smile from thy countenance? So I pleaded, he said. And I ventured to say when they all came back into the room, I shall never have such a pain again from this moment, for God has heard my prayer. I bless God that the ease came and the racking pain never returned. I think the point there is he's saying, and I think there is a sense in which we go to God and say, God, I mean, I'm a father of five kids. God, God, I'm in misery. 
If I could do something about it for my kids, I would. You love me. I trust you. But, oh, God, hear my agony. God did, heard the agony of Israel when they were in slavery in Egypt, and he heard their cry and had compassion. And Jesus looked at the crowds and had compassion on those who were in pain and without a shepherd. So God hears and has compassion on his people who cry in agony and lament. The last thing I want you to see, or the last portion of this passage, is 8 through 10. Look at verses 8 through 10. Depart from me, all you workers of evil, for the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies shall be put to shame. and great, the, All my enemies shall be ashamed and greatly troubled. They shall turn back and be put to shame in a moment. Do you see something clicks here? In verses 8 through 10, he's no longer broken. There is a mendedness that takes place. He's, he's mended in a certain way. He's brought back and healed. There's a click. He, he's defiant in his, in his face towards the enemies. And he says, depart from me, enemies. You're going to be gone. You're going to be destroyed. I'm against you. God is against you. Because God has heard my plea and God has answered and listened to my crying out to him. I have assurance that God is going to give me mercy. I am assured though I have confessed my sins and I deserve to be tormented because I am a sinner. God loves me with his steadfast love and has forgiven me. Get away enemies. Get be gone. My God is a savior and he is my savior, and he's heard me. You see, I, I don't know exactly how it happened. It could be that David was on his knees, and, and the Holy Spirit just spoke to him something like, okay, David, I hear you. I will keep my loyal love to you. You will again praise me. I will show you grace. Rest in my love. And, and the broken becomes mended. Is his suffering gone? His physical suffering? We don't know. Is his enemy still there? We don't know. Probably. But God has mended him. He, is, he has been touched. Some have called this, there was an answering touch that David experiences. Have you ever experienced an, an answering touch where you cried out to God and you don't know why, but you just know God's going to care for you. You don't know if God's going to heal you or her or save her, her or the person you're crying out to God or take away the agony that you face. But you know all is well because you know God has heard you and loves you and he's good. And he, he spoke that to your soul. Brothers and sisters and friends, God does that with his people. And he did that for David. He says God has forgiven, he believes God has forgiven and will heal and will make all things right. You see, this passage, Psalm 6, is about the psalmist beginning as a broken, desperate plea to God. And it ends with a mended heart that believes and trusts and has assurance that God is good and cares for him. As we conclude this, though, I want to bring to you the subject of discipline. David says, don't discipline me. Correct me in your wrath. Don't chastise me in your wrath. You can do it, but not in your wrath. Treat me like a son. It's, it reminds us of a reality that all of us need to understand and know as Christians. If you are a son or daughter of God, he has saved you, but he will discipline you. So I want to, it's in the back of your notes. I want to just give you five things. They're going to be really brief. I just want to list to you five truths important truths about God's discipline and our response to discipline. First of all, God disciplines all his children who are all sinners. If you are saved, you are his children. And if you are saved in his children, you are also still a sinner. And in this life, he's going to discipline you. Hebrews 12 says it better than anywhere else. Hebrews 12, 5 as he writes to a suffering church who they weren't suffering because they were sinning and doing all these sinful things. They were suffering by being persecuted for their righteousness. But he calls it the discipline of the Lord in that case. And he says, now just hold on and be faithful because don't you remember the promises from Proverbs? Proverbs 3, but he says, have you not forgot 
that God is addressing you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. Do not be weary when reproved by him, for the Lord disciplines in whom he loves. He chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you're illegitimate children and not sons. So be thankful that you are being disciplined. I want to say this, afflictions in your life are the, dis- the chastising and disciplining hand of God. I want, to cor- I want to add to this, though. That doesn't mean that if you're going through affliction, that it's a direct response to a sin in your life. I'm not saying that. It could be the proactive spiritual conditioning that God is choosing to do. When I was on a sports team in high school, I was disciplined by my coach in two ways. I was disciplined if I... If I was not running as hard as I should and I would have to do extra laps or extra push-ups, that's, that's corrective discipline for an offense. But then there was, there was conditioning discipline that says, I want you to be a disciplined athlete. So you're going to run laps. You're going to do sprints. You're going to do push-ups because I want to make you who you need to be. And God does both of those in our lives. He corrects us and he, he proactively spiritually conditions us with discipline. So that's where I'm saying God is always disciplining. We we should be thankful that he's disciplining us, even though it's hard. And he does it for all of us. But I'm going to say discipline is not punishment. Punishment is what the law does in getting justice against a sinner. All justice has been poured out on Jesus Christ on the cross for all those that are saved. That means that if God is disciplining you for something you did wrong, he is lovingly disciplining you to, in order to make you repent or see the importance of sin or to see his grace in a new way or to cause you to depend on him more. But he's doing all these things for our good. The second thing I want you to see is that discipline is painful, but it's loving. We, we just read and studied Psalm 6. It's painful. It makes people scream. It makes people sob like they can't stop. It can be painful. It is not like a young parent taking and doing a little paddle on top of the diaper and they don't even feel it. That's not discipline. Discipline hurts. And God does discipline, and it hurts, and it hurts. And we could say, like David, how long, O Lord? O God, have mercy. My tears have not stopped, and I've been crying all night. One great reformer in the 1500s went through great affliction. We, he, he, he went through affliction and probably stomach cancer and died in his 50s, but God used it mighty. He once wrote this. O Lord, your hand rests heavily upon me today. But I take comfort that it is your hand and not another. Because your hand is loving to me. It's resting heavy on me, but it's loving. And you see, there are many passages. Hebrews 12, 10 says that human parents discipline their sons for What seems best to them, but God disciplines us for our good so that we may share in God's holiness. For the moment, discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. I have five kids. I try to discipline them as I think is best. And I, in my best moments, I'm going to discipline them in a way that keeps my, my, my mind on the fact that I love them and I want them to have joy forever in heaven. I want them to know there's a God who loves them. There's a God they're going to give an account to, that they need to be responsible. They need all these things. And so God keeps in mind in his disciplining us I love you and I care for you and I'm not going to stop doing good for you forever. Oh, I pray that you and I would grow to, to though though we cry and lament in the midst of our suffering, we will know that God's discipline is loving to us. The psalmist said, it was good that you afflicted me for now I keep your word. 
Psalm 119, 67. God's love is always pursuing what's best for us. Our joy, our holiness, our, our joy in him forever. The third thing I want you to see is God's children, while being disciplined, should plead for mercy with the gospel. So if you know God's disciplining you, you might say, well, then I shouldn't ask for mercy because I just deserve this and this is his hand. No, we've learned from Psalm 6 that you're being disciplined from God. Get on your knees and plead like David for mercy. Plead with the gospel. Plead, oh God, have mercy upon me. I'm a sinner. I don't deserve your mercy, but I hope to believe that you'll give it in time because you loved me and you gave your son for me. What more will you, there's not one thing you withhold from me. God, you promised to work all things together for good. If you'd be your will, and I pray that you'll do this, please have mercy on me. Learn from Psalm 6 to plead God's steadfast love and ask him for deliverance. Plead with the desire to praise him and appeal to his pity, which is the next point I want you to see. Number four, God invites discipline children to lament. God invites us to get on our knees, to lay on our beds, and to moan and cry out to him. Give our complaints to God, saying, God, you are good, but I am hurting. God, I know you're faithful, but I am floundering. God, you are righteous, but right now I cannot take any more of this. Please help me. Psalm 6 teaches us that God is moved by our laments. He cares. He has compassion. As a father shows compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we're just dust. God, I'm so feeble right now. I just need you to put me back together. I do, my heart is breaking. Psalm 103, 13 and 14. And lastly, God's people can learn that when they're disciplined, either by affliction that wasn't from your sin, but just because God wants to get rid of sin in your life. God wants to grow you. God's children can learn that by faith, we wait expectantly for, could we say an answering touch? Oh God, you haven't delivered me from this pain, but God, would you just show me your love once again? Maybe, maybe that answering touch needs to come through your spouse or for, through a friend or your pastor or someone in, your, someone in your church. You reach out and say, I'm just hurting so much. Will you pray for me? And maybe God will use you to just remind them of the promises of God as we wait expectantly for God to help. Oh, I pray today, if you're crying out to God, you're lamenting, you're a difficulty, I pray that you will do such in a, it such a way that God would mercifully today just bring an answering touch. He might not take away your sickness, take away your heartbreak, take away the circumstances that have made you miserable or your enemies. But I pray that you will trust him enough and that he will minister you lovingly enough that you'll go, I feel God's care right now. It's not, it's not been taken away, but I feel God's care. I've, I've been a pastor long enough to personally experience that in my life as a pastor and seeing that in the lives of suffering Christians. Praise God for his ministry that way. David said, out of distress, I called to the Lord and the Lord answered me. And he set me free. On the day I called, you answered me. My strength of soul increased. I waited patiently to the Lord, and he inclined his, he his ear to me, and he heard my cry. He drew me out of the pit of destruction. Psalm 50. Friends, there's only one who could have prayed this prayer but not confess his own sins. Although he did confess sins, maybe our sins. Although the, he was under God's discipline, he was under the rod and discipline and anger of God heavily upon him for our sins. That's Jesus. Jesus cried out loud cries and tears on earth. His body was torn. His soul was in anguish. He pled the mercy of God for us. 
for you if you will believe him and trust him if you've not done that before already. He drenched his couch and bed with tears, but the tears of blood and agony because he was going to spread his arms and take the full wrath of the almighty God on himself that you and I rightly deserved. So he is our savior and Lord. The broken in Psalm 6, the broken believer is mended because the broken believer prayed. Prayer was the place of mending. It wasn't the mending because the place of mending is coming to the mending God, the mender, our father through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That is the only hope we have of mending. And he gives it to us and promises. Jesus boldly faced his enemies The Lord hears our prayers through Jesus. He's accepted us. He is our hope. He is the foundation of our cries for mercy. He is the reason that God is our Father and that we are disciplined in love for our everlasting good. Oh, may we grow as a people with that type of character, the type of relationship with God that learns how Psalm 6 works into our lives. As we cry out to God and learn and enjoy him forever. Let's pray. Father, I pray as the worship team comes, I just pray that you would help us to respond by just clinging to Jesus, our, the anchor of our soul, the, the foundation, the rock, the shield, the protector. Oh God, our sins and our temptations, even where we fail, Our doubts that come, oh God, I pray that you, I thank you that you can extinguish them in a moment. But God, even in those, you rescue us and save all your covenant for your steadfast love. For your steadfast love, I pray that you'd save someone in this room or online that is not yet saved. God, so that they would praise you and not remain in a place where they cannot truly praise you from the heart by your Holy Spirit. Help us now as we finish with this song. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together, sing to Christ, our sure and steady anchor.